To start us off, I would like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Divya Chandrasekhar. Dr. Divya Chandrasekhar is an associate professor in the Department of City and Metropolitan Planning at the University of Utah, specializing in community recovery from disasters. Her research focuses on post-disaster community planning and recovery policies in different regions. With a background in urban and regional planning, she actively contributes to organizations such as the Utah Seismic Safety Commission and the Roundtable on Risk and Resilience of Extreme Events of the National Academies of Science. Dr. Chandrasekhar, I'll leave it to you to introduce our other panelists and take it away. Thank you so much and thank you for having me um, come here and moderate this panel on this in incredibly important topic of rebuilding after disasters. Um, you know, I think recovery, especially long-term recovery from disasters is considered to be one of the least understood phases of disaster management, right? And, but it actually has arguably some of the most long-lasting impacts. Pretty much everything you've heard of in this, uh, in this one conference, from childcare to housing, is intersects with disasters and disaster recovery and resilience in some way. And so part of today is to discuss that important you know, intersection. Um, if you think about the long-lasting impact of communities, uh, of disasters on communities, you only have to think about places like Los Angeles after Northridge, the 1994 Northridge earthquake, it just changed the face of LA. Um, New Orleans is still recovering from Hurricane Katrina. It's gonna be 20 years. And if you think about the 2021 California fires, you know, this is gonna change the face of Plumas County and Butte County communities, those tiny communities, they will never be the same, right? And you'll see those impacts for the next 50 years. And it's one of the, uh, the problem there becomes when does recovery end, when does development start? And those are the kinds of um, complexities that make recovery sort of harder to address than say preparedness and response. So this is why you also see preparedness and response, disaster pre preparedness and response having step-by-step -step plans, right, guides. But there aren't very many for recovery. And part of the problem is you have to have the disaster to know exactly what you will recover, right? But it's also because recovery is a non-standard process. Recovery looks different for every community that express, you know, experiences it. So what you will recover is kind of depends on what happens to your community. But that does not mean that we do not have a great set of collective knowledge on how to recover, right? The best practices that make for sustainable, resilient reconstruction and recovery for communities, that we know. And today's panel represents a wealth of information and knowledge on this topic. They're the experts on the hows of recovery. So with us are Brooke Connor, um, who is a professional engineer and the recovery support branch chief at the Federal Emergency Management Agency, Region 8. With expertise in administrating FEMA grants and supporting recovery efforts, she leads three teams focused on engineering technical assistance, analytics, and interagency recovery coordination. Brooke's background in civil engineering and water resources enables her to evaluate and implement effective resilience reconstruction strategies while fostering collaborative, collaborative relationships amongst various recovery partners. Uh, also with us is Tanil Parker, who is the director of the Office of Disaster Recovery at the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. Ms. Parker oversees the significant portfolio of over 90 billion in community development block, block grants, CDBG, which I'm sure you may have heard of before in this, in this conference, the, the disaster recovery funds. So the CDBG DR. And she has demonstrated expertise in developing and implementing affordable housing programs while administrating CDBG and home investment partnership programs in Falls Church, Virginia. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Government and Politics from George Mason University and a Master's of Public Administration degree from the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. Welcome, Ms. Parker. Um, also with us is Jake Ganini, who is the Response Mitigation and Recovery Bureau Chief at the Montana Division of Emergency Services since June 2017. Here, he coordinates the state's emergency response efforts 
with an extensive military experience, including deployments to Iraq. He retired after 25 years of service in the Montana Army National Guard and the United States Marine Corps. Jake holds a bachelor's degree in emergency and disaster management and currently resides in Helena with his wife and children. And last but definitely not the least is David Bowman, who is the deputy director of the Division of Local Government in Colorado Department of Local Affairs. With extensive experience in disaster recovery and government service, he has overseen the CDBG programs in Colorado and Louisiana. His, his background includes you serves in the US Army and teaching, and he holds an MBA and a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering. Welcome, Jay. Um, I'd like to invite the panelists to give uh, comments. We have individual comments uh, that are prepared by them. So I'd like to start with Brooke and then uh, Tenno and, um, uh, to, uh, to Jay and then to David. Great, thank you. So we've all heard the story of the three little pigs and the big bad wolf that comes and huffs and puffs to blow their houses down. But it's that third house that's still standing because that little pig took the time, effort, and the money to make sure that he was building a house that could withstand the risks that the big bad wolf would bring to him someday. And it's those resilient reconstruction type activities that we need to be thinking about that can help us plan for what the future will hold with the increased intensity and frequency of the disasters. So at the local level, we can think about ways to better prepare ourselves within the communities, looking at mitigation plans to understand what are the risks and how can we address those ahead of the disasters to come? Pre-recovery plans. Do you know where your resources are? Can you build those partnerships now so that you can tap into them rather than when you are in the throes of doing an actual response and recovery effort? Look at pre-housing plans to know where are you going to be able to put the survivors while those recovery efforts are underway. So there's a lot of different factors that can come into the recovery process. And every disaster has a different feel to it depending on what the hazard is that comes in. And so we can be looking at a multitude of things that you might not think of. But if you have taken the time beforehand to think through some of those challenges, you'll be better prepared to handle those. And so let's think about a situation with a wildfire. After that wildfire is suppressed and put out, it can be a situation where it has impacted the lands or maybe it came in and impacted the infrastructure and the housing within a particular community. So now you're looking at how are we going to restore the watershed because now we're all of a sudden at a higher flood risk. What might seem like a easy little spring shower to make the green grass grow is now bringing mudslides and complicating the debris removal in a particular area. So how are we not only going to restore that watershed but then also address the infrastructure? Um, we're gonna have to look at debris removal, which can be pretty substantial depending on the amount of structures that were impacted. You are also gonna have to deal with an influx of building permits. Depending on the size of the community, maybe you only get one or two of those in a week, and all of a sudden you're getting 50 or 100 of them now, and you have to figure out how to deal with those. So there's a lot of different challenges that can come up. So looking to our example of the three little pigs, let's say that each of these three little pigs represents a community. We'll have uh, Strawville, Twigville, and Brickville, all right? And the big bad wolf is really mother nature. And so after a particular event occurs, rather than just quickly getting back out there to see how fast you can recover, what if those three communities could come together and learn from the community that had taken some mitigation actions into play? If they were damaged by a fire, maybe they had implemented clear zones, higher building standards. They had put in um, fire resistant materials and planted fire retardant vegetation. 
So taking a little bit more time on the front end to learn from each other, to collaborate together on how they're going to go about the recovery efforts, and also look at that watershed and how they can address the concerns now, because it's going to take a while for that watershed to be able to be restored so that it can handle those rainstorms that come in, whereas previously with it scorched, it's not going to be able to absorb that moisture. And so by coming together, it might take a little bit more time in the front end, but it's going to pay dividends on the back end. And we've seen that. So the Marshall Fire was the last disaster of 2021 and the first disaster of 2022 as it hit Colorado Boulder County area with three different communities being heavily impacted. And so those communities came together and there were definitely challenges. Um, I mean, debris removal alone was extremely substantial for them. But they came together, they worked together to come out with a plan. And we fast forward time and look at where they are now. They're actually three years ahead of schedule for getting people back into their homes compared to a typical wildfire recovery effort. So on the federal level, different types of support comes in and gets associated depending on what the particular disaster declaration is. So whether it's a fire mitigation assistance grant, what we call an FMAG, um, a major disaster declaration. So for say a fire, you could see it could start off as an FMAG declaration that then grows into a major declaration. And so there's different services and federal support that can be associated with those. And when we have situations, you know, we don't always get an FMAG request for every disaster that occurs with like a fire. There's different reasons for that. But it doesn't mean that there's not any federal support that could be made available. So one of the efforts that I will just highlight is our interagency recovery coordination. This is a team that's been traditionally stood up for large disasters and then pulled back down. But what we found is when we stood these up for COVID, we realized that there is a need in order to have these set up in a steady state stance so that we can continue the relationships with our federal partners. FEMA does not have all of the answers and all of the resources to help a community be able to recover from a disaster. So what we've been able to do with these interagency teams, and Region 8 is fortunate enough to have the first steady state team that's been operational since 2021 when we shifted out of COVID. And we've been able to build relationships with our federal partners so that even if there isn't a death, disaster declaration, we can reach out to our partners and say, hey, HUD, do you have any particular funds that could help this community with these challenges? And so we're working together in order to try to better understand what the resource, resources are out there to help the communities with the recovery efforts. So I, I will end it with this before I pass the mic, and that is just the time is now to look at mitigation plans, to look at pre-recovery plans, understand your resources, and build those networks. So preparation is the key to resiliency. And the best recovery is the one that didn't have to take place because we mitigated those hazards ahead of time. Thank you, Brooke. One thing to note, um, and it is not a coincidence that Congress chose to use community development funding to target it to long-term recovery. And that's because long-term recovery is community development. It is ensuring that our communities across the country after experiencing catastrophic desire, disasters not only recover, but they thrive and they mitigate against the same types of hazards that presented themselves to begin with. For the Department of Housing and Urban Development, housing is a key component of that. It is the linchpin for why many of these communities existed. It's why folks move to your states and your cities and your towns. Um, and so there's an emphasis on ensuring that there are opportunities and resources for the housing stock to come back. Uh, but we do not operate in a bubble. We also recognize that 
me building my home back won't protect floodwaters from coming down the street, down the road, or a breach if there's not a concurrent infrastructure investment. And so when we talk about long-term re community recovery, we are talking about all of the components. One of the things that we'll, we'll learn from all of our panelists and, and give examples um, is that we say at, at HUD, we hope this is the last investment. That's what mitigation is. It's your last investment so that you're not paying for the same recovery over and over again. Uh, when folks come home, uh, when the new residents come, they want to know, am I gonna lose everything again? And quite frankly, none of them have all of the resources to fully recover, not one, um, because it's that type of disaster that we're targeting. We would also note tips and, and ideas and resources, what you can do now. Perhaps you haven't had a Marshall fire or the camp fire, uh, but you've had a fire, you've had a landslide. The time to act is now, meaning the pre-work, um, understanding, particularly from a housing perspective, what is your renter and housing demographic? Um, and renter and homeowner specifically, but also housing where there are supportive services needed. How much of it do you have? Where is it? And if it were compromised, if it were destroyed, where else could you relocate both permanently and temporarily, if necessary, for those disaster survivors? You can know that now with an inventory of your housing stock. And it's more than just your ACS or your census data. It's really putting feet on the ground and understanding who lives in your community, where do they live, what are those rents? We'll also talk about protecting from hazards, but also understanding uh, water, water is selfish. Uh, fires are hungry, um, and those are appetites that do not get satisfied. And so we don't stop them from happening all the time. We protect, we mitigate our community so that we can come back. Um, and it's also understanding where are we most vulnerable now? Um, some of long-term recovery is also an honest management of expectations and an acknowledgement that some of the communities that we have were vulnerable long before the disasters. They were in places that were toxic. They were in places where it just wasn't healthy. Air pollution, things that were never an intention, but that also coincides with where there's a significant amount of our affordable housing stock in this country too. So how do we address that? One of the opportunities that we believe occurs uh, when communities receive community development block grant disaster recovery funding is that it offers the opportunity so that communities do not have the same scenarios that they had pre-disaster. If you had an affordable housing crisis before the disaster and there's an influx of resources for long-term recovery, you shouldn't have the exact same long-term affordable housing crisis afterwards. This is the opportunity, not only for the residents that are there, but for the ones you know are coming. Last, we'll talk about engagement. Um, our, our colleagues who proceeded before us, oh, I have much love for my planner friends uh, and my state housing directors. Uh, we know that, that there are local constraints, there are federal, there are state constraints to housing that we are working to rebuild and working to remove. Uh, but one of the folks who are often not part of that conversation are just mom and pop. It was, it was my ice cream shop that burned. It was my land that had been passed down for generations um, that you're now telling me I can't rebuild yet, or why not? Um, and why is it costing me more to do this? Community engagement is so critical. And it's even more critical for communities that don't normally engage. They don't show up at your planning hearings, they're not reading your websites, um, but they are going to the VFW lunch. They are coming out for County Fair Day. Meet them where they are. Work with the organizations that already have relationships with them. Um, you probably don't because you can't get everywhere in your states, but they do. Use them, fund them. I can hear them in my ear now saying, and don't think we're gonna work for cheap. Uh, you gotta fund them. They have staff who need to be compensated for the miles that they're putting on the road to get out to residents and communities that you can't just yet and, and speak their language to engage and get them engaged. Um, one of the things we'll also talk about is that after a catastrophic disaster, 
the desire to recover is huge. Um, the resilience of America comes out after a disaster. The number of people who are willing to lend a hand um, is huge. Uh, but there are also, months after the news stops covering the story, um, there are also folks who, this is a major setback, um, they, they lost hope in their state, in their federal, and in their local government. Um, they're not coming to your case management centers for signing up for things. In fact, you better not step foot on their property. Um, and so engaging them and understanding how, when we talk about whole community recovery, we're not leaving out those who really do need a hand, but maybe are a little afraid that your hand bites. Um, and so I'm looking forward to our discussion today and offering um, a couple of examples we've seen across the country in long-term recovery um, and things that you can do practically now before you've experienced a long-term long disaster. Thanks, Sunil and Brooke and Dr. And Chen, for setting this up, really appreciate it. We know we're the last thing before the end of the day, so we're gonna hopefully make this entertaining and lively and, and talk about some real scenarios. I'm a Montana, fourth generation, so I've lived in, in Montana my whole life other than the eight years I spent in active duty Marines. You know, in the last six years working at Montana Disaster Marine Services, we've dealt with a lot of different disasters. Well, on the first day when I started my job, description was defined to me as 10% 10, 10 of your job is response and the rest is gonna be recovery and mitigation and that is definitely true. So recovery is forever, it lasts forever. Mitigation is the center of the emergency management universe. We all love mitigation. We wanna mitigate ourselves out of jobs so we don't have to recover, but recovery does last forever. Mm -hmm. And really the, the best thing that we can take out is the disasters, they start and end at the local level. Um, and recovery can only move as fast as the local officials and local jurisdictions can, can match the pace of the state and the federal partners. And I'm gonna um, give you some examples. I love telling stories. I just came from Red Lodge this morning. We've been managing the big debris removal project from last year's June flooding event. But I'm actually gonna go back another year to June 13 of 2021. We had one of the first uh, declared FMAGs, or I'm sorry, let me back up, getting really excited. So the earliest declared fire management assistance grants in Montana was June 13th. 2021, it was the Robertson Draw Fire, it was about 30,000 30, acres. Two years later, this week, we're dealing with burn scar erosion issues that impact about 100 people that live out there. Just over a half inch of rain, sustained rain, can start blocking people from getting to their homes. And, and so, and, and it's, a big, it's a really big issue because that land is owned by U.S. Forest Service, BLM, county, private, so it's a complete mixture of ownership and who has to take care of the roads. And we're working with the U.S. Forest Service to help do some burn scar rehabilitation, um, reseeding, uh, Brooke described it really well, you know, mudslides, landslides. That's just a real example. I mean, witnessed this week when we were down in Red Lodge, not, you know, to count the concerns of the citizens in Red Lodge, Stillwater, Carbon Park with the, with the rising rivers that we have. Um, so th that's, that's uh, one thing that we really want to remember too is I like to joke with our, our, our public assistance director down at Region 8. He likes to say when things slow down or during blue sky days, I'm like, waiting for that day to happen. It's been six years. I haven't really had a blue sky day yet. So that, that, the thing to remember is after the disaster happens, we're, we're so good at response. We, we've been fighting fires in Montana for over 100 years. We, we lead the nation in our Northern Rockies coordinating group with um, having state representation, both at the emergency manager and the Department of Natural Resource Conservation. Um, at the local level, we have our county fire wardens, we have our county, our, our, fire, our, our fire chiefs association, we have our, our federal partners, and they're all really great at working together on response. We do a wonderful job in Montana protecting the citizens and getting firefighters out. And it's, it's those 5% of fires that can happen that can cause your long-term impacts, like with the Robertson Draw fire, like with, the, with the, the, fi the fires that we had in 2017, the eight fire management assistance grants. Our state in Region 8 has had and managed more fire management assistance grants than any other state. Other states like Colorado have had worse fires, obviously, like Brooke explained, the, the fire in uh, de end of December of 21 and beginning of January. We also had the Denton fire. People, I hopefully remember, that was November 30th and December 1st. We lost more homes in the Denton fire and that fire in Great Falls and we did all year during 2021 in a two day time frame. We didn't get a federal declaration. We didn't have an individual assistance de declaration. That was really upon the homeowners working with their insurance companies, you know, getting the proper permits to rebuild their homes. It is a lot of work. Um, 
So long-term recovery, it, it feels like, you know, yesterday was the 11th month mark of our flooding last year. We have been working really hard with our state and our federal and our local partners. And, and they're really key to making sure that we're doing what we can to bring back the new normal in the counties and cities and towns that were impacted by the flooding last year. One of the things that's really important to our local elected officials, the mayors and the counties, we were down there in October with our field director from uh, Region A, our new recovery program manager. It was her third day on the job. I still feel bad for her. And we sat down with the, the county commissioners and the mayors like, where's the elected officials from the state at? It's five months later. I'm like, you know, that's true. This is important. It's important six months later, a year later, two years later. Uh, everyone, <laughs> I gotta be careful what I say, but right after disasters, it's a big political opportunity for to be people out there. But six months later, super important. A year later, as we're just getting approval to rebuild bridges, you know, restore the infrastructure so people can drive back and forth to their homes and restore the critical services. It's our lieutenant governor, our governor, great job bringing down. Um, and bringing all our regulatory agencies together, our federal partners, state partners, NRCS, um, the conservation district, uh, our state regulatory agencies, and we really set out a glide path to get permitting um, to, to do all the, the permanent work and to, to, um, the emergency work and help people with their homes. And it's, and it's just a, it's a good thing to highlight the importance of recovery six months later, two years later, 10 years later. It never stops, it, just, it lasts forever, and I could talk for hours and hours and hours, but years after disaster, we're still working to, to, to help the citizens in the state of Montana. We look at addressing gaps where we can. Uh, I don't know if it's gonna come up later in questions, so, but I could talk about it now, it's fine. We had a new program that came out with the Disaster Recovery Reform Act of 2018, and I talk really fast too, sorry, I get really excited. A lot of things to cover in a short amount of time, I know you're waiting to go to lunch, Bozeman's beautiful, hopefully you can go hike the M, I'm going on a hike. I, I was stationed here for five years when I was with the National Guard, I, lo I love being here. Um, that, that Disaster Recovery Reform Act came out with a program that helped offset the cost of permitting fees and floodplain permits, it was a six month program. It's only six months though, it ends, it has to be congressionally changed for six months. Our state is not considered a really big disaster. We start looking at Hurric Hurricane Ian, um, you know, Irma, Marie, Harvey, we can talk for hours in the really big disasters, but it's a big deal. We have a local floodplain manager that normally processes 10 to 15 floodplain permits to help the people you know, recover, and now she's processing 165. And the throughput to get 165 floodplain permits, the time just doesn't line up. You, and you can do 10 to 15 a year, and then we get offset cost for six months, helps, it's great. We need to make it two years, we're working on that. Um, so we came up with other mitigation programs to help offset those costs. When you have a county like Stillwater County, they don't have in their budget to pay half a million dollars for unforeseen permitting costs because of the results of the flooding disaster last year. Um, we actually talked to Minister Criswell about that, the NEMA mid-year forum of help increasing local capacity. It's really about local capacity. If anything you can you remember out here, it's the locals, it's the local floodplain manager, it's the emergency manager, it's your public works director, it's your city planner, it's your mayor, it's your county commissioners. They're there every day talking to the people that are impacted, you know, restoring the public infrastructure, doing what they can to prepare for the next flooding, recovering from the last year, looking at mitigation projects that will help them in the long run. So I hope I haven't gone over seven minutes, so. Okay. Is it, so. All right, so I think I'm good. I'm looking forward to this panel. I've been very excited about it, very passionate about the, the things we're going to talk about, and hope you can walk away from here and learn something after the panel's over. All right, I guess I'm, uh, I get to be the anchor. Um, so like Jake, I'm going to try to squeeze two days' worth of discussion in about seven minutes. Um, I'm going to kind of break it up into to two. One, I'm going to talk about what we're doing with state funds and federal funds in this latest disaster that has uh, been innovative. There's been some, uh, I think we're on the path to a better model. Um, of course, what I talk about today, you're not gonna see all the stuff that happens below the water, all the challenges and, and all of that. Um, and then I also wanna get into um, some policies, some challenges that we still encounter consistently across disasters. Um, you know, I've been doing this for about 18 years and I've actually seen a lot of positive change, but there's still things that we need to work together, federal, state, local, and uh, see where we can make some improvements. Um, so first I wanna talk about the Marshall Fire a little bit, which has already been mentioned. Um, this was largely a suburban fire. Um, for you land use folks, it's almost exclusively single family. Um, we did have a few condos get damaged. Um, 
but it's not part of the, the wildlife urban interface as you would typically expect it. This was high winds, 100 miles an hour, blowing ash across the five lane highway and setting suburban neighborhoods on fire. Um, so we lost about 1,100 homes in that. Um, so it's quite a unique situation. Um, one of the things that we were able to do, thanks to our legislature, is they brought in some state funds. And when they were putting together the legislation, um, we took that first draft and we tried to model a lot of the things that HUD does for long-term recovery and put that into the state legislation so that we can do comparable programs, particularly if the DR funds might not be available. Um, when I say DR funds, I mean HUD, CDBG, DR. Um, so we were able to get started because usually there's a long delay between your disaster and when you actually get that grant agreement. So we were able to start a little bit earlier with the federal funds and one of the things that HUD allows us to do is pay for pre-agreement costs. So we can get started and then you know bring their money in later, which is, which is huge. Um, the other thing that we're doing a little bit differently and uh, this is kudos to, to HUD as well for adding this 15% mitigation component. What we're doing with our mitigation is we're providing additional resources. Um, if you're low income, this acts as a forgivable loan. It doesn't come out of your pocket. If you're higher income, it's a loan that'll revolve back. Um, but there's an extra $30,000 for mitigation activities. So when you talk about those imposed costs that fire mitigation occurs, you know, fireproof vents are more expensive than regular vents. Cement siding is more expensive than wood siding. Um, triple pane windows are more expensive than your standard. So rather than have that homeowner sitting there going, gee, I'd like to do those things. I'd like to protect not only my home, but my neighbor's homes. Um, I just don't have the money. So we're, we're trying to provide those resources so that they can do the right thing. Um, and like every disaster, um, there's never enough resources to cover everything. So, you know, we're doing what we can in that area. So I, you, you, she mentioned I was a teacher, so I'm trying to appeal to the visual learners well, uh, in the crowd. Well, thank you for all those insights. You know, we have a set of questions uh, for you, and then we will take a little break for audience questions, and we'll come back for more panel uh, discussion. Uh, My first question is really to... Can I, can I get to at least oh, to yes. the last slide? Oh, yes. Sorry. Absolutely. Um, Go ahead. So a couple of things. One thing I wanted to cover is, and just to help people recognize that... Um, there's so many employers involved. Like if the insurance industry did what we all thought it did in principle, none of us at this table would have a job. You know, those homeowners would apply for their insurance, they'd get the money they'd need, they'd rebuild, local governments would be insured, and we wouldn't have to be here. But it's a lot more complex than that. Um, there are issues with the insurance industry. Um, we have nonprofits, VOADs coming in with various capacities. They're involved in the mix. We have state resources come in. We have federal resources come in. We have the locals on the ground. And everybody's doing different things. And they're all focused on that thing that they are supposed to do by their charter or their board or their federal rules. So when I talk about these challenges, it's not to be... Um, you know, to disrespect anybody and what they're doing, but we all got our head down doing our work and we've got to have somebody lift their head up and, and help us coordinate. And that's where uh, these six challenges come from. And uh, we used to like to say uh, a problem without a solution is just a wine. So I've also proposed some solutions here. Um, and I'm not gonna, not gonna read the whole slide for the sake of time, but I did want to put some things out there that we can begin to work on because really, aside from venues like this, there isn't time to do this kind of work and really talk about how we're doing things. We tend to spend a lot of time on, these are the rules, these are how you follow them, but we don't ask the question, why do the rules exist and where can we change the rules? Um, so just real quickly, I'm gonna run through these six. Um, under insurance, we all know the issue there. Um, appropriations for the, for the HUD long-term recovering money, it's unpredictable and it takes a long time. Um, if we could get HUD an annual appropriation so that they could actually react more quickly, um, they know there's damages. They might not know the exact damages, but we should be able to get a quick infusion of cash and start helping people much sooner than the 18 months, the two years that it currently takes to get that funding. 
Um, allocation model, um, I have to put this on there because we're Western states. Um, when there's a fire, the, the HUD model relies on IA data. Well, if you're insured, which most fire victims are, you're sort of taken out of the formula. Um, and that's a problem because there's still large uninsured costs. Now, if you're a flood victim, you're probably not in the floodplain and you probably don't have insurance, so those counts are a little bit higher. Um, so that is a problem that California's uh, working on, Colorado's working on, and we're in communications with HUD on those things. Um, timelines, I mean, I, I can't say this enough. This is the biggest impediment, particularly for households and businesses. I mean, it's great that you can give a business a grant um, and SPA comes in right away. Um, but what we found with our latest disaster that half the folks didn't qualify because of the ability to repay. So those folks that don't qualify, the grants aren't available for another year and a half, two years. And they're not around that long. So really, if we can address one thing, it's gotta be how quickly we can get these recovery dollars out. Um, data sharing, that is part of the problem. I've been involved in disasters where it has taken literally six to nine months just to get the data that we need to then provide to HUD to prove that we have uh, these damages. We're all federal, state, local partners working towards the same mission. We ought to be able to you know, share that data up and down the line, local, state, federal, I'll be looking at the same data with the same lens and understanding what the problems are, and it should not take six to nine months to make that happen. Um, and there are ways we can address that. Um, and then finally, just the, the requirements um, changing year to year. And HUD has made a lot of progress in putting together consolidated uh, plans, but there are still a lot of rules out there, and you know, as Tanil said, local governments are frightened. You know, because they have all these rules. Um, quickly, you know, more tools, less rules. We need to do more than just say, you need to comply with A, B, C, and D. We need to give them the tools to do that. And maybe we don't have to do A, B, C, and D. Maybe we just need to do A and B. And there is a lack of consistency across the board. And, you know, we're, I was a little bit shocked, and this was just last week, we were talking about one of our congressional earmarks, and it's a HUD-funded program. And they said, oh, we don't have to do Davis-Bacon for this. And I'm like, well, we've been fighting this for 15, 20 years on Davis-Bacon and the disaster, but we can just waive it for a congressional appropriation. So those kinds of things we need to look at. Where do those rules make sense? Maybe we can waive things we thought we couldn't waive, um, et cetera. So putting that out there, starting the conversation, there is, again, this is a two-day seminar at least. Well, you anticipated my first question, which okay. you already answered. I was going to ask you how your recovery experiences, you know, have informed your actions or what you would offer. And these seem like great six points uh, that people can take away at least. So maybe I'll move to the next question, which is we were discussing, you know, the constraints that federal programs pose sometimes in terms of when funding is released, et cetera. Uh, to local communities, but I, I'm also curious as to the constraints within which federal programs operate, because there is also this di another dimension to this institutional framework. So my question is to is to Tanil and to Brooke, in your work, uh, you know, representing federal uh, programs, what are some of the constraints you face, and which might the rest of us explain some of the things we experience. I can, I can start. The, uh, I like to use the analogy of uh, the potluck dinner, or for some communities, they call it the pot blessing. So they say you announce, all right, we're doing potluck. Friday night, meet at the community center. Someone is bringing chocolate cake. Great. There's four chocolate cakes at the potluck, right? Because no one communicated that you're responsible for dessert, and you're responsible for the main entrees, and what about for side dishes? Well, disaster recovery funding uh, in the country actually started out the same way. Um, and it was focused on each federal agency, but it wasn't built to have us rely on the same set of rules. So funding that comes from FEMA has a set of rules, funding that comes through from HUD has a set of rules, and the same is true for our partners. And so when communities have to then put all the funding together, and they are putting all the funding together they can, 
for long-term recovery, they are running into the obstacles of, wait, I can do this under that program, but if I wanna add this funding, I can't do that. And, and it requires quite a bit of effort just to maneuver that. Um, and so while the federal people resources are on the ground to help, to help navigate that, taking a step back at, okay, what, what do we really want to see in our national disaster recovery framework um, and what needs to happen statutory wise or what needs to happen at the executive branch level to make it so that the combination, the leveraging of funds is much easier. That is the, a chief constraint I hear, particularly from local communities um, that are sub grantees of states. And I would also add that a lot of the times after the disaster, um, they see the federal support come in and all of a sudden folks think, great, they're going to make us whole again. And the purpose of the federal support is not to come in and make a community completely whole after a disaster, but to be able to support them in their efforts. And so making sure that the local communities and, and that the states have a, a plan on what do they want to see for their recovery efforts so that we can come in to support their desires on where they're trying to go with those. Um, it is definitely a multi level recovery effort. Um, Jake alluded to that earlier and you know we can come in with all of the reinforcements that you would need, but at the state and local level, if, if you have one person that's wearing multiple hats and they're not ready to switch over from response into the recovery efforts yet, we need to like pull back and slow down to make sure that we are not overwhelming the communities. And so it's really making sure that we have support at all levels to put enough emergency managers into the local communities and, and into the state and not just fund only federal employees doing emergency management because it really is, a, a, as you talked about the potluck, I mean, everybody needs to come to the table. And it's also making sure that we get out of our silos and understand that like we need to coordinate recovery efforts outside of just the emergency management industry because it takes all of us coming together to look at the multitude of issues that we can comp like collectively respond to. Um, so that's, it's, I think what you're highlighting is really a, a significant role for local and state organizations. And I think, Jake, you were mentioning that this is a local problem disaster. Start locally, they end locally. And I'm wondering, given the incredible complexity of rules, actors, you know, actions that are happening in recovery, have you also seen innovations that come out that maybe navigate some of these or like circumvent some of these uh, more problematic aspects of recovery? Yeah, um, that's a great question. We're always trying to do ways to streamline and make things more efficient. Unfortunately, government's just not efficient, and that's just, I, I hate to say it, but it's not. I'm a state employee, not as bad as federal uh, government, but, <laughs> and we can all laugh about it, because it's true. So, but we are really working with ways to be more modern when we come to like, do we need to put eight people out there to go inspect roads or can we fly some drone imagery that does 3D modeling and we can have one guy do it in two hours? That's just an example, a real world example from last week. But we're trying to do things that we can, you know, cut cost, uh, increase the time that we can actually get true assessments of like damages. And we're doing that too on the, on the, on the homes when we do the home uh, assessments. We're, we're using LIDAR mapping, we're using drone, we're, our Department of Revenue flat, flew, it's called Falcon View, I think, they flew some really great imagery right after the flooding disaster last year, and we use it today. We're using it this morning. Um, we're really trying to do um, use technology like ArcGIS, Survey123. FEMA's been a great partner. I, I, I give FEMA a hard time all the time, but they're really trying to do modern things to streamline the process so it's not some times we hear about people that get visited 10, 15, 20 times. To, to do assessments, that's a true story. It happens on the housing side, happens on the public infrastructure repair side. Um, I don't know how many times we went out to the Nye River Road repair project, we've been out there lots of times. Uh, but it's, we're really trying to do things that can increase the time to get the work done so we can start the actual rebuild and recovery process quicker at the pace like like Brooke said, we, we, have, we have local emergency managers that do wear four or five hats. They might only be a, a, or a 50% funded employee. I mean, if we really want to look at how we can help recovery long-term, 
fund more people at the local level. We don't need more people at the, at the federal level. We have plenty of them. We need more people at the local level. When we're working with like a mayor or a county public works director, that's one person. And we're saying, you need to do this, and we need this, and we need this by, you know, you have two weeks to get to us. There's, it's a lot of pressure. And, and they feel it because they're the ones talking to the homeowners, the business owners, the people that can't get across a bridge because they're still wor working to get the, the engineering studies and designs so we can get that approved. Um, it's, it's a process. So anything that we can do to, to I mean, I, we, we have multiple contractors working for us right now. And some of the innovative technologies that they do, it's amazing. So I'm like, well, private sector's got to figure it out. I mean, they're, they're the key, really. We have great private sector partners at the state and national level when we go to like, annual forums for their National Emergency Management Agency, we, association, sorry, we see a lot of private sectors that have decades upon decades of experience of trying to help locals um, recover when you don't have a big staff at the local level and the state level. Our, our region, Region 8, doesn't have a lot of um, capacity. The state, I mean, Colorado's probably got the most, but then you look at Utah, then you get down, get down to Wyoming, they've got 22 people in their state emergency management agency. I mean, that's less people than in like one department in, in, in some regions. So we're really trying to do things that we can look at to increase the time to get work done, whether it's using some of our technology, partnering with people that have the, the technology to do it. And we're always trying to do it and reduce costs because we're always looking at the cost of the state and the federal government and, and the locals. So it's a fine balance. Um, you have to do it right at the beginning or you're gonna be doing it um, over and over again. And that's just an impact and more pressure on the locals when they have other responsibilities that that isn't going out to a site and looking at it for the eighth time in two months. We hate doing that to, to any of our people. Um, but I, I'm really excited about some of the new things that, that FEMA's doing and, and some of the, the, the changes and streamlining some of the, the processes. So I think Brooke will cover that more later. But yeah, at, this, at state and local level, we're always looking to increase how we can more quickly recover. And I think that's a... I'm not gonna go into like funding things, but technology, it's great. Firefighters use it. A lot of our, our, our incident management teams use it. They're great at it. Cal, Cal Fire is great down at Cal OES. They can do real-time damage assessments during a fire. Like, here you go, here's our IA inform information. You got it, boom, done. So I'm like, this, this stuff is instantaneous. It's not like the old days where you got to send it in an email and put it on a spreadsheet and, and yeah. The we we gotta stay is, in modern times. Funding is a really critical thing. And especially, Dave, you were mentioning the, the delay in getting CDBGDR money. I'm really curious, uh, interested in hearing the Colorado experience with that gap funding that you were talking about. Could you tell us a little bit more about it? Uh, yes, it's a, it's a state bill 22-206 and it created the Disaster Resilient Rebuilding Program. Um, it was only $15 million and for a $100 million gap, but it is enough to, to get us started and we can actually, you know, we're able to design a program. Now, my hope is that that program is gonna be kind of in the box for the next disaster, so we don't also have that delay in how we had to design it. Um, but part of the challenge is you always have to tweak it for every disaster, and part of that reality is you don't know how much money you're gonna have, so you can't offer everybody, uh, let's say, a cap of $200,000 and then find out you're only gonna have 10 million to serve 500 households, it, you know, the math just doesn't work. So um, that's, and that's part of the complexity of not knowing exactly how much you're gonna get and when you're gonna get it. But um, I do think that will allow us to streamline for the next disaster, which hopefully I'll be retired by the time that next. Uh, <laughs> It'll be this weekend. And I want to in, uh, invite the audience, if you have a question that you'd like to post the panel on things that we've discussed till now, maybe you have an innovative, or some creative thing that you've seen in your community that you would like to share? Is there anyone with a question or a comment? And there's a mic coming up. And if you could introduce yourself, that would be uh, My name is Marianne Warmerdam. I represent an organization of 40 rural counties in California. Yes, we do have rural counties. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the challenges that we've had, particularly in the wildfire scenario, is reconnecting to the grid. Mm -hmm. And uh, in part, it's because the grid itself is in sub jeopardy in many of the wildfire areas. But I'm wondering if you have any tips and tricks in terms of how we can expedite reconnecting to the grid or, or 
uh, further affecting enhancement of the grid to not only avoid wildfire implications, but also to add those new housing projects that we also need. Well, I can take a shot at that because I, in fact, do do work on, on grids and, and wildfires. Um, you know, one of the things that we found uh, of interest is, or one of the things we found to be imp impactful is when communities have thought about their energy in the future, even before a disaster strikes. So uh, the previous panel was talking about just a lack of comprehensive planning. People don't do comprehensive planning anymore. And that's a problem. That's one place where you would think about your infrastructure development and how the future for that infrastructure development. So not having that is definitely a, a, a real major issue. Right? And now you're confronted with having to redevelop and you don't know what you want to do. So you have to start planning all over again. But also maybe thinking outside the box of what does it mean to be connected to the grid and whether the grid needs to look the way it needs to look. Should PG&E underground their entire cable for $20 million, which is what they're looking to do? Or uh, maybe probably like half a billion dollars. Never mind, it's a really large cost. Or should it be more microgrids? Should it be more uh, renewable energy resources, things that are more community controlled or more you know, sustainable in the long run? For the community, they don't have the same issues of big transmission lines sparking off a fire, for example. So a little bit thinking outside the box is, is definitely important. It is also a problem that needs to be addressed from local all the way to the state level because this is not just a community saying, never mind PG&E, we'll just do this ourselves, you know, have to sort of involve these uh, utilities, et cetera. So uh, I wish there was a simple one short answer to this, but the fact is it's complex and you've got to embrace the complexity and just work yourself through it. I would offer uh, lessons from Puerto Rico as part of their rebuilding now. Um, that is the number one fear. Um, the number one trigger for PTSD is the power is going to go out and we'll be in the dark for months. Um, every rainstorm, it happens all of the time. Um, and, and one of the things that was very much a community-driven solution um, that is now partially being financed by the private sector, partially being financed by uh, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico is community-based energy solutions. So whether that is microgrid, so investing some of that recovery funding in, in and with local uh, public utilities, or it's also looking at equipping individual property owners with a sustainable battery solution that allows for survival for X period and a key point particularly for vulnerable populations, folks who are relying on power to, for um, assisted breathing devices and other medical equipment, prioritizing those households for the receipt of that type of technology. Um, so those are just some of the solutions coming out of Puerto Rico, but that was a hard fought solution after, after many people perished because of a lack of power. And yes, there are the bigger infrastructure where you can underground, underground. Um, putting the grid back in the line of fire is just going to get it taken back down again. Um, and so what do we do differently that addresses individual needs, community needs, until we can get to the larger infrastructure investments? Um, this is actually, I mean, Puerto Rico and power is a long conversation. 30 years of history of PREPA not providing, <laughs> they were not having power for eight months even before Hurricane Maria. But uh, there's a real question of social equity here. And you know, you really can't speak about, about disaster recovery without talking about those pre-existing vulnerabilities. There's a saying in, in academics like myself that there is no such thing as a natural disaster. There's a natural hazards, but disasters are constructed because we put ourselves in the way of harm, right? We build our communities and we under-equip a significant part of our community to deal with these disasters in an adequate way be resilient. So in your work, how have you uh, encountered the issue of equity? And then how have you worked perhaps to make sure that it is truly a whole community approach? Uh, maybe you can start with Dave. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll start with saying one of the lessons I learned very early, um, and you know, the mantra that we can't make you whole has, has you know, we've been saying that for 20 years. 
and it's true, we, we can't make everybody whole, but for those folks that are at the bottom, if you don't make them whole, they're not gonna recover. Absolutely. Um, you know, and when we had, you know, Hurricane Katrina, one of my jobs was to say, okay, Dave, you've got $750 million, make a housing program, and the only way the math could work out is if you give people 75% of what they need to rebuild. And if you are working two jobs and you're living paycheck to paycheck, you don't have that extra ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars to invest in your home. So you're going to fall by the wayside. Um, so that's an early lesson. We have to identify those communities, find those communities, and those people at the bottom. You do have to make them whole um, because they they can't come back if you don't. I would also note um, to your point of of the things, the cre the hazards we created. Um, one of the early lessons on was when we're talking about buyouts or when we're talking about home reconstruction and, and you're using federal resources to help rebuild those homes. Um, when we talk about the valuation, how to size that award, and you look at assessments of those properties, um, it seems like a neutral a neutral math equation. You're, you're doing the right thing, you're looking at the pre-disaster price. Well, if pre-disaster there was a history of redlining in those communities or undervaluation or toxic pollutants that then depressed housing values, they're still going to be reiterated when you do that same methodology for your housing recovery programs. Um, so that's, that's an equity conversation. That's, you know what, it looked facially neutral, but its implications are severe for those who pre-disaster were already on the losing end. And so taking that into account um, and working with the groups and organizations, you know, your social services departments and agencies, they know a lot. Um, and, and, and you may not have the federal data set, but your state data sets are huge because they, this is the people that they serve often. And it's all incomes. They can tell you things about schools and about health outcomes that have to become part of your long-term recovery. And that, that's where you start to address some of the inequity that existed pre-disaster so that you're not baking it inadvertently into your long-term recovery efforts. And I would just say that, you know, within the recovery process, it's not just one model that we are going to go out and say everybody has to operate the same way. Like when we go out to say tribal nations mm -hmm. that are recovering from a disaster, um, doing it virtually does not work very well. Yeah, um, we need to be able to meet our survivors where they are. And so being able to go out to the tribal nations, to the communities, understand what their needs are so that we can customize the type of support that we're able to bring in and provide. And so just, it's the open communication and just being able to listen to what their needs are so that we can adjust the resources that we're bringing to address those needs. And Brooks points and, and those that have been mentioned by Jake, these are pre-disaster. If you wait until the disaster happens and that's the first time you've been to a tribal community, it's the first time you've engaged social services, it's the first time you've contacted any of the local organizations, food pantries, it's too late. Um, and so now is the time to get those relationships. It pays dividends. Um, and I see that in communities who've had to start and stop their housing programs, um, who, who are struggling for outreach. The communities already that had those relationships that established them in, in what we call blue sky, they were able to get off the ground a lot faster um, because they already knew they could reach out to the local ecumenical group. They could reach out to the school districts because the schools had a liaison who interfaced with state and local partners that that's how they could push information through school families rather than relying on websites and when the power is down, bye-bye website, rather than relying on radio communication same power issue, right? They had to get to people in different ways. Um, and so those are just really practical examples now. If, if you take anything from this particular question, it's engagement now. HUD has a great citizen participation and equitable engagement toolkit 
free, download it on the HUD's website, um, and it was written for the disaster recovery context after working with communities that had starts and stops and fails um, on the community engagement front. And those very communities, um, we called them and said, we really want you to tell your story because you have a good story now. Um, it didn't start off that way, not by intention, but they have a great story now to share so that no one else has to walk down that same road and no one gets left out. Um, so I encourage you, get the relationships now. I mean, it's not just with elected officials um, because you know some of the very communities that, that are often non-responsive, they're not coming to the polls either. Um, and so they're not talking to the elected officials. You've got to engage with the folks they're engaging with. Jake? Yeah, I uh, just want to talk a little bit about the town of Fromberg in Carbon County. They're a really low income community. Um, about 30 to 40 veterans in there. That's probably almost half their population. And 60 to 70% of them, I'm just getting this from the mayor of Fromberg right now, I want to have real notes. It, you know, they're, they're elderly. So you've got elderly population, you've got low income, and you've got veterans, and they're always at risk for flood. They're, and, and they're not gonna survive. Their town is not gonna be able to keep moving or to keep being a town because of the risk that they're at and they don't have the financial capabilities to, to recover. Um, we talk, one of the things you can do to prepare is, you know, obviously have flood insurance, but that just doesn't fill the, the gap. There's still a big gap. Um, most homes that are along the rivers in Montana cost a lot more than $250,000 to build. And, and, and I, I know we know that for a fact. And I, I think in addition to, you know, get your community partners, your communities, your, your co-ads, your communities action disaster, and your state VOADs and having your volunteer at the state, a volunteer agency liaison is one of the most crucial and important positions in every state, and every state doesn't have enough of them. So, and to include having state personnel that can really take on the FEMA individual assistance program and, and be the task force you know, leader for that and, and manage it, even though it's a FEMA program, what I was told for many years, it is not a FEMA program solely. It's really uh, a lot of partnerships at the state level, um, other state agencies, and the local level. You know, get your church, all your churches, you know, we're working with the Haitian Water District right now that their, their water system is, is, is not functioning right. It's going to take 18 weeks. It's not a, a disaster, though. It's, it's because of infrastructure that is having problems. So we're working with our volunteers, and we've got truckloads of water coming in. And this is stuff that happens all the time that your locals are managing, and it doesn't even get to the state level until it becomes a bigger issue. So that's why the locals really do... Um, they're the ones out there talking to the people daily, getting, getting the information they can to, to help them uh, and to try to help them be more resilient down the road. Uh, I just, I think that, that there's, there's just some situations where it's, it's heartbreaking to go out and talk to these homeowners like what is gonna happen again? And I'm like, it probably will. Like, what can we do? You can move or you can do acquisition relocation you know, there's other options you can do. There's just not a lot of options for people that don't have the financial backing to, 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 to protect themselves. And with we heard on a really well done panel earlier, there's not a lot of housing in Montana. Um, and it's not very cost effective to build a house right now. Or so, anywhere at this moment. What's that? Housing is not there anywhere at this moment. No, Every and, place and in Montana's Montana an example, and it's, it's, it's like that in most of the Western United States. Um, you know, it seems like there is uh, definitely what happens before the disaster explains a lot of what happens after the disaster. So if, you're, if you have severe poverty, extreme inequity in the community, you're not going to see it get better. You're going to see it get way worse, right? We call it exacerbation. Disasters exacerbate community trends. If you have out-migration, you're going to have more out-migration, not less. Right? If you have more poverty, you're going to have, you have poverty, you're going to have more poverty. In the same vein, though, if you have a strong, interconnected, you know, highly networked community, you will also see that come into play after the disaster. So it seems like a lot of what we should do for recovery should be thinking a little ahead of time, and that maybe a lot of disaster work actually happens in the development moment. It's the building of the house that needs to consider disasters and not after the house is gone and you're rebuilding, right? So if you have, and I, we have such short time, I'm just going to ask the panelists to give one last big comment. And if you could focus on perhaps your best advice 
uh, or a tool or a resource that you would like to offer to the panelists, to the, uh, to the audience today, to take away from here, um, what would be the one thing that you'd like to tell them? So I would say don't build for the now, but build for the future. And we're not saying that you can't live in these beautiful areas that we live in or near the water or, or within these beautiful forests that we have, but we need to be able to respect nature and take that into consideration in how we build. And building codes and building standards are a great way just to make sure that we are taking those things into consideration so that when Mother Nature throws the next event out, we are not starting at scratch with a community that's been decimated and having to get back on their feet. So mitigation works and we've seen it work all the time. So when you take that time, the extra time, and yes, it might be a little bit more costly on the front end, but it pays dividends on the long end when we take those efforts to make sure that we are rebuilding resilient communities that can stand, withstand these increasing frequency and intensity of the disasters. So if building for the future, I'll add to that, allowing space for your growth and surge for, and long, for long-term recovery. Um, so we have some states where there's a restriction on the number of public employees that can be added. Well, that's exactly where the need in long-term disaster recovery is. That's more permitting officials. That's all of that pipeline um, is coming from that. So being able to not only accommodate that in local legislative efforts, uh, but the same is true for alternatives. What are your alternative locations for education? If the only high school is on this side of town near the water, where, where are you going to temporarily relocate students so that that part of recovery can happen? Again, a lot of the pre-work, um, but it's also engaging. So pre-work engagement of alternatives so that you can surge um, and, and be ready. Um, I'd also note having the frank conversations with your communities that are in high vulnerability areas. Um, in the Columbia, South Carolina area, um, after the flooding events that happened in 2015, we were shocked. We saw a lot of communities raise their hand, residents, and say, we can't do this anymore. Like, we want, we want to see a buyout program. Like, that's, that's it. It was nuisance flooding, and then it turned into this, um, and, and that's too much. And so that was a shock, because for most, buyouts mean tearing apart the local framework. But what they envisioned was, we're doing thoughtful options through home buyer assistance to move to other places in our community that allow folks to stay, but not in harm's way, um, because they couldn't make the infrastructure investments given the vulnerabilities. Um, those are discussions to have now. What would happen if, and, and when it's community driven, that is critical. Um, versus we're telling you, you have this option, that's going to raise an equity issue. How did you know that that was the model that worked for us? And why does my neighbor across the street have this option, but I don't? What, what made us different? And we both had losses. Um, so factoring those things in now are key. I see we have um, two and a half minutes left. I'll be really brief. It, it really takes a, a, a full team. It's a full team approach on preparing to recover and recovering. And it starts really at the individual citizens in the, in the communities, all the way up to the federal level. And it, it, I can't state that enough, that it's, it's year round, it's nonstop, it's forever. And I wanna once again put a plug in for mitigation. We love mitigation, it's the best. Invest in mitigation, um, spend a little money to save a lot of money down the road. And it really is, it, it, when we talk to the counties and the towns and the tribal nations, it, you invest in mitigation, um, whether it's mitigation after or mitigation, you know, pre-mitigation, mitigations can't say that word enough. Uh, we did, we do want to thank, you know, the legislative session and, and our state leadership and the governor. We did get a $4 million year mitigation fund that's going to really help to, as a match to these big mitigation pro projects we're really going to keep applying for and, and making the state more resilient because disasters are only going to get worse. They're just going to continue getting worse and, and we can all sit around and say, oh, it's not gonna happen again. Well, it is gonna happen again. It could happen this weekend in many different states. Um, so we, we just, we, we've got to work as a team and, and really happy that we're in Region 8. I'm glad that Brooke came up here. She has a great 
team underneath her and she has a really good um, region aid administrator. Make sure she hears that I say this too. So um, <laughs> we're, 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 we got a great region and we tell everyone in the rest of the regions that we're, we're fortunate to have such a, a forward leaning um, and, in, and, and, and doing things to, to help our citizens in all the states in our region. So that's all I got, um, thank you. Yeah, just uh, really quickly, I think for, for this audience, one of the things that we find happens a lot is that you have the big disaster, it's political, everybody's engaged, and then they forget about it. And not only do they forget about it, but then the capacity at both the state and the local level also becomes sort of unfunded and they drift away. So this has to be part of your annual budget at the state level. I mean, you, you have to pay for this. And at the local level, it's the same thing. You can't wait till after the disaster and then you're hunting for talent um, around the state or around the nation and you can't find it because there's other disasters bigger than yours and, and you're stuck. And the people that are hurt the most, as we've said before, are the people that don't have resources. So those are the ones you're gonna lose. So if we wanna solve that problem, we really have to fund recovery and uh, we also need to fund it quicker and more consistently. So start a savings account and flatter your FEMA regional coordinator. So the two things you can take away. Um, if you would indulge us by giving us a few more minutes, if you have a question, we are willing to take it. So if anyone has a question, we can take one. Real quick, um, yesterday we heard the Forest Service gentleman talk about a community navigator, which I'm super supportive of. Um, Coco Collaboratives Communities in, in Colorado works nationally and they have a really fabulous program that, that they're working on. I heard again today local is what, you know, you need capacity building at the local level. I heard, or I know that SBA has a community navigator program. FEMA has a navigator program. But when you search this online, being a person that just lost your home, <laughs> you're trying to figure out the navigation of it all, you really have no idea where to start. Is there something that you guys can do at your level to really influence coordination and better communication that isn't so web-based? I'm sorry, you nailed it with what you said, Tanil. When the power goes out, you can't access those. It's neighbor to neighbor talking about it. They're the navigators. They're the ones that talk about it and figure out solutions. So if there's some way that you guys can promote that local effort, I think we'd be better, better served. I think you bring up a really good question. And I'm gonna give an example of a good friend of mine who worked in Kentucky Emergency Management right after the tornadoes of two years ago. He, he was working for the Department of Forestry and an 80 year old lady, she's like, I'm supposed to take pictures. I don't have a cell phone. You know, there's no power. He's like, I'll do it on my phone. It's really boots on the ground. And because people, their worst time, you're coming up to them and say, we need this. You need to fill this out. You got to get on, online and do this. You, that, it, that, that's why the local communities that are they're there are so important that they're the first ones out there. One of the things we tried to do is we build like a strike team of people in SBA, Red Cross, individual assistants, state people, and went out to try to visit them and help them do it all um, quickly and efficiently. And you, you can't do that realistically when you have such a, a massive like hurricane or, or a far reaching tornado like we did in Kentucky, but you gotta do what you gotta do on the ground. Because I love technology more than anybody in this room, but when you have no power, you don't have a phone, you know, you're back to like bringing it out on a piece of paper and filling out for them, because that's the last thing they wanna do. I have to say, get to know your urban planner because your urban planners are already doing similar sort of community development work. There's navigators, we don't call them navigators, but there's a lot of uh, work happening, which is uh, working with community residents, community leaders to engage other you know, uh, community residents. It's at that moment that you want to integrate forest service navigators, FEMA navigators, you know, SBA navigators. That's the moment to do it uh, because you have you know, time and relationships and trust building takes time. So that's why we're talking about comprehensive planning and the integration of just good old development with disaster planning. One of the things that um, 
Iowa, who is one of our, our flood grantees, did um, demanded is, is a better word. So it, in the urban environment, Cedar Rapids was ground zero for them. And so they said, that's it. We're establishing a one-stop shop. Now, FEMA already has the joint center where folks can come in and apply for programs. They can apply for FEMA, individual assistance. They can apply for SBA. Uh, but what Iowa did was take that one step further and say, hey, other federal agencies and other state and local agencies, you need to set up a, a desk here too. And that we're going to put out on all of our media and all of our areas, all of the community networks, here's where you can go if you're in those areas. So to t let's take that now a step further, particularly for rural communities. Now you have to put that in like your mobile, your mobile unit, right? Getting those same agencies to commit to boots on the ground to say, okay, we're going out to, to southeast Montana now and let's do our normal roundup because today it's, it's open information day, it's open application day. So they're there, they have the technology they need, they give them the MiFi devices, like you have to outfit them to meet the community where they are. Um, and, and it's coordination because you might need the school to open up so that you can have a site. Or you might need some of your local houses of worship to pony up, can we just use your space for a couple of hours? Um, because it's the most communi community based space that allow the people to come out to the community. So that's that's a, a model that you've seen used elsewhere, blood drives, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Use the same models. Tap into the networks that communities are used to doing and bring the services to them rather than just coming here or a web-based solution for when power goes out or those who are still uh, not quite digitally literate enough to navigate um, or see, quite frankly, I know my people, we're trying to make our screens bigger because that darn application is too tiny. Mm -hmm. Be, re remember us, right? So making sure that your, your tools and resources match the needs of your population. Um, and that's, that's not new things, that's not buying a whole fleet of vans, although, you know, go for it. But <laughs> that is taking advantage of something that already exists in many communities. Well, th my thanks to all the panelists for being here today. We're at 12.05, a little over. And thank you for indulging us for that extra time. If you could please give a round of applause to our panelists. Today. I'm sure you can.